Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Island Uplifts History Class. It is so good to have you. Now in today's lesson, we will continue our look at the European rivalry that occurred in the Caribbean region. And specifically, we'll take a look today at the establishment of the island colonies. Now our objectives for this topic goes as follows. Firstly, we'll look at the establishment and economic development of the island of St. Kitts. Then we'll take a look at the settlement of Nevis, Montserrat, and Antigua. Then we'll look at the settlement and revolt of Barbados. Then the settlement of Bermuda and the Bahamas. Then the English conquest of Jamaica, the French island colonies, the Dutch and Danish island colonies. And finally, we'll take a look at the Europeans and the Kalinagos, also known as the Caribs. So are you ready? Let's get into it. Now, before you there on the map is the area that the Spanish had labeled as the wild coast. And in our last episode, we looked at them as the area known as the Guyanas. Now, there were three European countries that attempted to develop settlements here, the English, the French, and the Dutch. Now, the English were the first of the three to venture from the Guyanas and up the islands of the Eastern Caribbean. Now this movement from the Guyanas began with two men, Thomas Paynton and Thomas Warner. Now when most of the British settlers had abandoned the failed Oyapok River colony after 1605, and we spoke about that colony in our last episode, and returned to England, Paynton and Warner were the only ones who decided to stay behind. Now Paynton was the first of the two to leave Oyapok but he didn't go back to England immediately. Instead, he sailed north along the Eastern Caribbean islands and explored them. He then sent word back to Warner telling him about the islands and especially one particular island that caught his attention, the island we know today as St. Kitts. Warner then left Oyapok to explore the islands and in 1622 arrived at St. Kitts to check it out for himself. The aim was to see how suitable the island was for establishing a colony. We want to take a look at the establishment of St. Kitts. And St. Kitts is frequently referred to as the mother colony of the English colonial territories in the Caribbean, or simply the mother colony. So we have to ask a question. What made St. Kitts suitable to become a colony? Well, firstly, the island was unoccupied by the Spanish. Secondly, the island was easy to defend against military attacks, and it was unlikely that it was susceptible to military attacks because it lay to the windward of Puerto Rico in a passage that Spanish ships generally avoided. The island's soil fertility was also really good. It was really fertile soil. The terrain of the island was not too mountainous, yet it was not too flat, it was a good in-between. Therefore, this presented the right conditions for tillage of soil and also for infrastructural development. The island was also inhabited by what, what, what seemed to be friendly Kalinago people, also what the Europeans call the Caribs. Now, Thomas Warner then went back to England got financial and resource-based support for the colonization effort and returned to the island on January 28, 1624. He, his son Edward, and other willing settlers established a settlement along the southwestern coast of the island in an area known as Old Road. The settlers then began clearing forest lands to make room for building their houses and for farming. They grew tobacco, which was initially damaged by a hurricane, but subsequently it became very successful. Warner then returned to England in 1625 to secure a royal approval and a royal charter for this new colony and to also get a patron for the colony who would become a proprietor of the island in order that his tenure on the island would be secured. Now, the island was then named St. Christopher's Island officially in honor of the first European to spot it, who was Christopher Columbus. However, the local English settlers used the name Kit 
as a shortened version of Christopher. It therefore adopted the name St. Kitts. Now, while Warner was away in the year 1625, a French privateer by the name of Pierre Belain, who had an official title that was known as the Sieur des Nambouc, arrived on the island seeking help for his ship that was damaged by the Spanish in the Cayman Islands. Now, the English not only helped the French with the ship repairs, they also approved their request to build a settlement on the island. This, of course, meant that the European population began escalating quickly on the island, which seemed good for Europe, but it became a major point of concern for the local Kalinago people. Now, upon Warner's return, remember, he went to England to deal with a lot of issues and, and deal with a lot of things concerning the colony to make things official for the colony. Upon Warner's return, the English and French had already established a united front that frequently fought against the Kalinagos or the Caribs. This led to many of the Kalinagos being banished from the island, being massacred, and many of the women being used as slaves. Now, a formal agreement was made between Warner or the English, and Desnambouc and the French, who, who represented the French, sorry, in the year 1627, which went as follows. Now, firstly, the English would occupy the middle section of the island as seen in the map right there, and the French would occupy the northern end and the southern end. The northern end was known as Capistier, and the southern end was known as Bassitier. The English and the French would also have to share fish ponds, salt pans and ponds, harbors, roads, and fishing grounds. Both English and French settlers would live at peace with each other, even though their mother countries would be at war. This was a policy. And fourthly, both would fight with each other against any common enemy, primarily the Spanish and the Kalinagos. Then in the year 1629, the Spanish sent an armada because they felt threatened. So they sent an armada to attack the island and chase the English and the French away. Now, most of the English settlers were captured and sent back to England. The French and some of the English escaped to the hills to avoid capture. When the Spanish left, they either went back to reestablish their settlements or they became buccaneers. Now we want to take a look at the economic development of St. Kitts. Now the main factors that define the economic development of St. Kitts were these four primary factors. First of all, there was an increase in the island's population. Secondly, there was the introduction of the proprietary system. Thirdly, there was the introduction of indentured servants. And finally, there was crop production and development. Now, the population of the island went from a little over a dozen in the year 1624, when it was just settled, to over 3,000 by 1629. Then by the year 1640, it had risen to over 20,000, which included settlers on the southern island of Nevis. Now, after the Earl of Carlisle became the proprietor or the owner of the island, a proprietary system was put in place. Now, here, the proprietor would pay the British crown a yearly part of the total revenue, along with a percentage of any minerals discovered or custom duties and import goods attained. In St. Kitts' case, for example, the Earl of Carlisle was to pay annually 100 pounds and 20% of all gold and silver found, as well as custom duties attained. In this system, local farmers were taxed by the proprietor, while the proprietor would supply them with weapons to defend themselves. Now, this was the ideal situation. This was the ideal requirements. However, this was not consistently done on St. Kitts, as the Earl of Carlisle taxed the farmers heavily, but gave them no weapons. What? <laughs> Indentured servants were invited to come and work on the island. 
working for their masters for about four or five years. That was the contract. Their passage to the island was paid and they were supplied with lodging and clothing. Conditions, however, became bad as they were treated poorly, thereby resulting in many persons becoming unwilling to go. Soon, the British crown had to resort to sending criminals and beggars there to work. Conditions in St. Kitts became so bad that many ran away to become, once again, buccaneers. What is buccaneers? Don't worry. We'll get in another episode. Don't worry. Now, Tobago became the island's main cash crop, with one ascending an initial shipment of 10,000 pounds of tobacco to England in the year 1625. However, the lack of proper subsistence farming meant that there were great food shortages and there were also low incomes. Some crops introduced by the English, such as wheat and other grains, also did not grow. So therefore, this brings us to the point of factors that challenge the survival of the St. Kitts colony. First of all, there were hurricanes. And you know that that was a challenge and still is a challenge for every single Caribbean island. Then there was the challenge or the, the impact of Kalinago raids. Then there was the lack of subsistence farming. There was unfamiliarity with tropical agricultural products. There was, fri there was friction between the English and French communities. There was the threat of Spanish intervention. There were English settlers who were experiencing a lack of support from England. And finally, there was poor and selfish management of the colony by proprietors. Now, there were some other islands surrounding St. Kitts that were colonized by persons that Warner would have sent out from St. Kitts. Warner sent a man named Anthony Hilton to explore and settle the island of Nevis, which occurred in the year 1628. Hilton then became Nevis's first governor. Then, in the year 1632, Warner sent his own son, Edward Warner, to explore and settle the island of Antigua. Edward became Antigua's first governor. Then, in the same year of 1632, Warner also sent out Anthony Brisket to explore and colonize the island known today as Montserrat. Brisket became Montserrat's first governor. Now, Warner felt free to send persons to explore and colonize these neighboring islands because they were already declared by British monarch King Charles I as belonging to Britain. In his royal charter of the year 1625, King Charles I saw the lands as being discovered by Thomas Warner, as being occupied only by a savage and heathen people, and as not being in the possession or under the government of any Christian prince, state, or potentate. The charter included the islands of St. Kitts, Nevis and Montserrat, along with other islands in the immediate region. But there was another island that was explored, and it was an island that was located to the northeast of St. Kitts. It was called Barbuda. It was explored in 1628, which was the same year that Nevis was colonized. However, this island was very barren and it seemed to be a bit too hostile to be colonized and such efforts of colonization were quickly abandoned. Now, Barbuda was explored in the first place because many thought that it was mentioned in the King's Charter. Because you see, a name of a particular island was mentioned along with St. Kitts, Nevis, and Montserrat. And it was assumed that the king was alluding to the colonization of Barbuda. So they saw the island. So when they saw what the king wrote, they said, well, it has to be the king. The king means Barbuda. However, it was realized that the king in his charter was not referring to the island of Barbuda. He was, in fact, referring to the specific name that was actually written. He was referring to the colonization of the island known as Barbados. So let's take a look now at the settlement of Barbados. Now, the colony of Barbados was not founded by an individual per se. 
It was founded by a maritime company called Quartin Brothers. Now, Quartin Brothers conducted business with both Dutch and English settlements in the Guyanas and in Brazil. Now, in the year 1625, while sailing from Brazil to England, one of the company's ship captains, a guy by the name of John Powell, saw and landed on the island of Barbados, claiming it for England. Powell told Sir William Courteen, who was one of the ship's founders and owners, about it, and Sir Courteen decided to engage in colonizing it. Okay. He left, meaning Sir Courteen, he left the colonizing effort in the hands of Powell and his brother, Henry Powell. Now, Henry Powell arrived on the island in February of 1627 with 80 men, 80, 80 men, and they established a settlement on the western coast of the island called Jamestown. Now, Jamestown was later renamed to Holton, which is the modern day name for this specific location. Now, the English settlers then sought the expertise of the Dutch, specifically seeking the help of Grunewagen's settlement in Dutch Guyana. Remember, we spoke about Grunewagen and his settlement. Well, just ensure to look back at our previous episode to get more insight into that. Now, Grunewagen sent 32 Arawaks who helped to show the English how to cultivate tropical crops such as maize and tobacco, as well as sending them other plants, seeds, and seedlings. The English, however, were not grateful. Instead, they reacted by enslaving the Arawaks that were sent. Oh my goodness, wow. Now, what made Barbados a suitable place to build a colony? We asked this about St. Kitts. Let's ask it now about Barbados. Firstly, Barbados was located to the windward of the other Eastern Caribbean islands, thereby making it difficult for the Spanish to attack it from any of their Caribbean bases. Secondly, it was uninhabited by both the Spanish and the Kalinagos. Now, there were Amerindian people groups on there, and they lived there before, but it was practically uninhabited by both the Spanish and the Kalinagos. Now, there were hardly any mountains which made agricultural and infrastructural development easy to achieve on Barbados. The soil was also very fertile. There were also many forested areas with diewood trees, which opened up the possibility of the English operating a timber industry, as well as necessary provisions for infrastructural development. So Barbados was poised to be the ideal colony for the English. But even though it seemed ideal, there were many difficulties that occurred in establishing Barbados as a colony. Now, the Courtin brothers invested up to 10,000 pounds towards the development of Barbados. The population also began to increase, although initially it was not as high as that of St. Kitts, but eventually it actually grew faster than the population on St. Kitts. Now, the Courtin brothers had the Earl of Pembroke as their patron. However, remember the Earl of Carlisle from St. Kitts? The Earl of Carlisle, who was already the patron of St. Kitts, claimed Barbados as his own. Oh, Lord, this guy. Despite the Courtine brothers petitioning to King Charles I to fix this matter, King Charles supported the proprietorship of the Earl of Carlisle for Barbados. Now, Carlisle then appointed Charles Wolverston as governor of Barbados. Henry Powell disagreed with this and reinstated his brother, John Powell, by force. Then in the year 1629, the settlers on the island accepted Wolverston as governor because, as every politician tends to do, he promised them 10 acres of land each. Oh, boy. <laughs> in that same year, Carlisle sent a ship which was captained by Henry Hawley, and Hawley arrested John Powell. Hawley then eventually became the island's governor. Now, just as he had made things difficult in St. Kitts, the Earl of Carlisle's proprietorship made things difficult in Barbados. 
under Harley's leadership, there was heavy taxation, miserable working conditions, and corporal punishment for even the slightest of issues. Settlers also focused on growing tobacco so much, and this is just to show you how wisdom was not applied here. Settlers focused on growing tobacco so much, they wanted the money so much that they neglected growing their own food to eat, resulting in a period of starvation on the island, which was predominantly seen between the years 1629 and 1631. Then in the year 1639, Harley established Barbados's Parliament, also known as Barbados's Assembly, which was the first representative body in the English islands of the West Indies. Wow. This Parliament was established because Harley was found to be attempting to replace Carlisle as the island proprietor. <laughs> Bacchanal. <laughs> Carlisle removed him as governor, but the island's planters did not know that. Harley promised the planters a parliament, which made them elect him as governor. Of course, when he was elected governor, I think he only lasted a year because he was removed or he stopped governing in the year 1640. So yeah, it was short-lived. Now, Barbados grew faster than St. Kitts population-wise and economically. By the year 1639, there were over 30,000 settlers on the island. Now, subsistence crops had to be grown to combat the occurrence of starvation as a result of the increase in population and as a result of the island's dependence on tobacco. Cassava, maize, ginger, and indigo were grown, and tobacco was traded with Dutch merchants for salted meat and other food supplies. And this was done while the Dutch were passing Barbados en route to the Guyanas and to Brazil. Now, initially, the colony of Barbados was seen as being underdeveloped with poor housing, poor roads, and primitive agricultural practices. However, by the year 1657, the Barbados colony had become a well-established and refined colony. But an interesting event then occurred on Barbados, an event known as the Revolt of Barbados. Now, in the year 1642, civil war broke out in England. What? King Charles I was seen as introducing arbitrary rules and even had members of the British Parliament arrested. As a result, in the year 1649, Charles was eventually opposed and executed. Then from the year 1642 to 1660, England experienced a period known as the Interregnum, which saw the country as being a republic under the leadership of Civil War leader Oliver Cromwell. So therefore, in this 18 plus year period, there was no official British monarch who was officially sitting on the crown, on, on the throne. Wow. Now, the settlers of St. Kitts, Barbados, and the other islands decided to be neutral in the whole affair. Although this was the official stance, in reality, there was a divide that was created in the colonies between anti-royalists and pro-royalists. Now, the new British Parliament began taxing the West Indian colonies heavily. Big mistake. Barbados was seen as being more independent than the other colonies as it had its own parliament and its own trade mechanism that was conducted with the Dutch and that trade mechanism was independent of England. As a matter of fact, Barbados traded so much with the Dutch that they didn't need to be dependent on England at all. This of course was seen as a threat in the eyes of England. Therefore, when Lord Francis Willoughby of Parham arrived in the year 1650 to act as the island's new governor, he used this as an opportunity to revolt. This was because Willoughby was pro-royalist and was actually appointed by the new monarch, King Charles II, who was technically not the official monarch because he was operating in exile. Now, Willoughby openly proclaimed King Charles II as king. 
and sought the support of the other islands, which only Antigua kind of gave official support, but he still sought the support. Cromwell and the British Parliament then instituted an act called the Navigation Act of 1650, which sought to control the trade and economy of Barbados and even sought unofficially, but really and truly it even sought to give a perception of the settlers on Barbados as traitors, thereby banning all trade with the island. All trade, meaning even trade with England. They were trying to ban all trade to really somewhat punish these traitors. <laughs> In the year 1651, Governor Willoughby then retaliated with this navigation act by issuing a declaration of independence. Wow. The British Commonwealth, led by Cromwell, sent a fleet led by Sir George Icecube, who forced Willoughby and his men on the island to surrender. Now, here's the thing. Many of Willoughby's men then went over to Icecube's side, thereby leaving Willoughby powerless. The Articles of Surrender were drawn up in 1652, and Willoughby was removed from his position as governor and was also removed from the island. Barbados was allowed to keep its parliament and governor, and taxation measures would be instituted only by the consent of the Barbados parliament, meaning they had to speak um, with the Barbados parliament and come up with a taxation solution instead of just implementing the taxes on them like that. All trade bans were lifted except that the island was prohibited from trading with the Dutch. Now Cromwell then appointed Daniel Searle as the island's new governor. Now Willoughby, he didn't stop there though. Well, at least he didn't continue any further pursuits with independence for Brazil. But Willoughby went to the Guyanas and established a colony there with some of the settlers from Barbados. The colony became a prosperous one focusing on sugarcane production. The colony would then later grow and develop into the country known as Suriname. Now, despite Barbados not actually becoming independent, the revolt brought to light the grievances that the colonies had with their mother country. This would open the floodgates that would later lead to events such as the American Revolution and the eventual end of the British rule in the centuries to come. But check this out. If the Barbados revolt was indeed successful, it would have made Barbados the first independent nation, meaning independent from European colonial rule to be established in the Western Hemisphere. Wow, 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 wow. Let's look at the settlement of some of the other islands in the region. Now, Bermuda, and Bermuda geographically is not near the Caribbean region, but historically and culturally, it is pretty much Caribbean. Now, Bermuda was discovered by the Spanish in the year 1506. However, they did not formally settle on it. The English were the ones who settled on it in the year 1609, almost, um, almost 100 years after, a little over 100 years after, actually. <laughs> It became the first island to be formally settled on by the English in the New World. Now, residents on the island became expert sailors and fishermen. Now, years later, in the year 1648, William Sales formed an institution known as the Company of Adventurers for the plantation of the islands of Eleutheria. Now, Sail and his company ventured out and explored and established a colony on an island in the Bahamas that is still known today as Eleuthera Island. Now, Eleuthera is Greek for freedom. 
Now, the British monarch at the time, King Charles II, in the year 1670, and this is after the whole Oliver Cromwell, England is a republic fiasco, King Charles II is now back on the throne, so he is now doing his kingly duties. So King Charles II granted all the islands of the Bahamas to a group who were the proprietors of the English-American colony known as Carolina. Now, the group from Carolina created a settlement on New Providence Island in the year 1672. Now, back to the Bermudians. Now, remember, they, had, they were the first ones who, who went over to Barbados to try and establish something there. The Bermudians then began gathering salt on the Turk islands or the Turks islands from the year 1678 and they established trade routes involving salt with other sister colonies. As a result, a triangular route what as a result, a triangular route was established that saw salt being traded between the Bahamas, the American colonies, and Bermuda. Then in the year 1684, a Spanish fleet, they felt threatened, so they felt threatened. A Spanish fleet from Cuba attacked and plundered Eleuthera Island and New Providence Island. The settlement on Eleuthera Island ended as a result of this, but the settlement on New Providence Island bounced back from the attack. As a result of this, in the year 1694, the tongue of NASA was founded. Now, the English began settling islands step by step by step, but they were about to capture a territory that was going to be a crowning point in their conquest of the Caribbean, Jamaica. So let's take a look now at the English conquest of Jamaica. Now, of all their territories, the Spanish paid the least attention to Jamaica. This was because primarily no gold was found there. <laughs> it was therefore the territory that the least number of Spanish settlers visited. But despite this, some settlers grew tobacco, cotton, sugar, cocoa, and various types of fruits there. They also raised cattle to supply ships with meat, hides, and animal fat. Now, the Spanish settlements on the island were, one, very small, and two, they were located along the coastline. Only the island's capital, which was Villa de la Vega, also known as Spanish Town, was seen as a large settlement. As a result of these factors, many English privateers used the opportunity to attack and plunder these coastal Jamaican settlements. Now, remember Oliver Cromwell? So we're going back a bit here now. Oliver Cromwell, who was at the time the ruler of England, implemented an anti-Spanish policy. He wanted to increase trade and help spread Protestantism throughout the region. He was then advised to progress in attacking the Spanish by trying to capture Hispaniola in a plan that was known as the Western Design. This was a stupid move because, yes, we know the British presence, the French presence, and the Dutch presence would have weakened Spain to an extent, but it would have been absolute suicide in those days to try and touch Hispaniola. Absolute suicide. <laughs> in the year 1655, Cromwell sent a fleet under the leadership of Admiral William Penn to capture Hispaniola. This venture proved to be unsuccessful as Santo Domingo was well fortified and the journey caused many English soldiers to die from sickness and exhaustion. Havana in Cuba and San Juan in Puerto Rico were also highly fortified. So they're wondering, what can we do? There was therefore only one option. There was only one island that they could have possibly attacked, and that was Jamaica. Now, on May 10th, 1655, the English landed at Passage Fort, which is in the modern-day Kingston Harbor. Now, the Spanish had a fighting force of about 500 soldiers throughout all Jamaica. <laughs> so the English were easily victorious. Now, the Spanish fled to Villa de la Vega or Spanish Town and carried their valuables with them. The English hesitated to go after them, which was a big mistake. 
Then the Spanish went the next day on May 11, 1655 to negotiate terms of surrender with the English. Now the English wanted the Spanish to flee the island and for all of the nationalities such as the Portuguese who are also present there to become British citizens. The negotiations took a week to be finalized. And guess what the Spanish did? The Spanish used that week duration. <laughs> they used that time to flee to the north coast of Jamaica and into the mountainous areas like the Blue Mountains and so on. Then General Robert Venables, who led the attack on Jamaica, who also led the failed attack on Santo Domingo, and his men, they were senseless and unstrategic, I guess you can say unstrategic, in conquering Jamaica. As a result, many of them were killed by Maroons and slaves who were loyal to the Spanish. So the Spanish were getting local assistance here. Now, Admiral Penn and General Venables gave up the task and both of them sailed back to England with Penn hoping that Venables won't put the blame on him if he, Venables, got back there first. Oh, my Lord. But guess what? The British Parliament, Cromwell and the British Parliament, they did not give up and they sent someone else to try and achieve the task. Lieutenant General Edward Doyley. He was made the new commander of the army. In May 1658, the Spanish sent former governor of the island, Cristobal Arnaldo Isasi, to attempt to recapture the island. Now, Isasi and 1,000 soldiers traveled from Cuba and landed at Rio Nuevo on the north coast of Jamaica. Isasi had the help of willing Spanish settlers to fight along with the Maroons and loyal slaves. However, Doily attacked from the sea and eventually he brought the Spanish resistance to an end. Jamaica was now officially an English colony and Doily, not immediately, but eventually became the island's governor. Now, Cromwell then decided to make the most out of Jamaica, thereby giving up on conquering Hispaniola, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. The British Parliament would assume governance of the island through the governor without instituting a proprietary system. Soldiers were encouraged to settle there with over, <laughs> over 1,000 Irish girls being sent to the island to encourage soldiers to settle there. <laughs> All right, what an encouragement. <laughs> Many other young men, primarily Irish and Scots, were also sent to further settle the island. Now, the British government made immense efforts in encouraging persons to settle on the island, especially women, because it was seen, the island was seen in those days as having a very concerning shortage of women. Settlers also ventured to the island from the American colonies and other island colonies, especially Nevis. At one point in time, over 1,200 settlers moved from Nevis Island to Jamaica. Now, Spanish Town remained the capital city for a while, but Port Royal in the Kingston Harbor began handling the majority of the island's economic affairs. Cromwell even authorized Port Royal to be used as a military base for the British to operate from in raiding and capturing Spanish and Dutch ships. Now, capturing the Dutch ships was a bit tricky, especially seeing how large the Dutch naval force was. And of course, even capturing Spanish ships would have been quite a risk because you were surrounded by heavily fortified Spanish colonies. Nevertheless, this is what Cromwell did. The Spanish and Dutch ships, if the raids were successful, were then brought back to Port Royal. Now, eventually the rest of the island was inhabited with the institution of sugar cane plantations. The Spanish eventually gave up on recapturing the island and officially recognized it as an English colony in the year 1670. 
Now, after Jamaica, the nearby islands of the Cayman Islands were settled and colonized by the English in the year 1670. As a matter of fact, for uh, a few years, the Cayman Islands was seen as like an offshore part of the Jamaican colony. So that's just a little um, insight there. Let's now take a look at the French island colonies. Now, St. Kitts was the first French island colony that was established in the Caribbean. However, many French citizens did not want to settle there due to the limited amount of land available and the inability to expand due to the presence of the English. Now, French captain and governor of the French part of the island, there's Nambuk, I remember we spoke about him earlier, he tried to expand and he had difficulty in holding on to the French lands on the island. He, however, was able to send French settlers to explore other islands that the English did not explore. French settlers were sent from St. Kitts to the islands known as Guadeloupe and Martinique in the year 1635. Guadeloupe, the more northern of the two, was more difficult to settle. This was because the French settlers who went there were not as skilled in tropical agriculture and were very cruel to the local Kalinagos. The settlement effort on Martinique was much more successful. The more southern of the two, Martinique was occupied by settlers who were skilled in handling tropical agriculture. However, the settlers drove the Kalinagos into the eastern part of the island with guns, which made the Kalinagos there more afraid of them. The settlement efforts on Guadeloupe and Martinique were done by a company officially set up in St. Kitts by Desnam Book, which was called the Company of St. Christopher. However, in the year 1635, after the settlement of Martinique and Guadeloupe, the company was replaced by another institution, the Company of the Isles of America. Then in the year 1639, the French government sent Chevalier L'Envier de Poincy to act as Lieutenant General of the French Islands. De Poincy operated from St. Kitts and orchestrated the establishment of the new French island colonies from the Virgin Islands in the north to Grenada in the south. Now there were contentions with the island of St. Croix as it was settled by the English and Dutch jointly since 1625, which didn't sit well with the Spanish who tried to drive them out. However, a collaborative effort with the French helped the three nations to overcome the Spanish and recapture St. Croix. The French and the Dutch also agreed to share the island of St. Martin. So that's why today we have one half being called St. Martin and St. Martin right, because you have the Dutch and the French side, and that is, of course, the case today. Now, the point C then set up a governor in Martinique who was to capture the island south of Martinique. Although there was great difficulty, they were able to capture St. Lucia and Grenada. This meant that all Eastern Caribbean islands were now captured by the French, the English, or the Dutch, all that is except two islands. Dominica and St. Vincent. Now compared to the other islands, the Kalinagos on the islands of Dominica and St. Vincent were difficult to overcome. Along with the island's terrains, the Kalinagos here were very strategic militarily. As a result, in the year 1660, the Poincy had to make a treaty which stated that they, the Kalinagos on these islands, should be left alone. Now, due to bankruptcy issues, the Company of the Isles of America had to be ceased. The French government then decided to sell the colonies as proprietary colonies as the English had done. The colony's existing governors were given a chance to buy the colonies. However, due to financial constraints, they couldn't do that. This, them fellows were like, no, not at all. As a result, partners were brought in to help in the financing of the island colonies. So, for example, the Poincy in 1651, he bought the islands of St. Kitts, St. Martin, St. Croix, and St. Bartholomew on behalf of the order that he belonged to, the Knights of Malta. This was a military religious order whose members belonged to rich aristocratic European families. 
Now the proprietary period, it lasted until 1664, when a new company was formed that was called the French West India Company. This company then took over the affairs of the islands. Then in the year 1674, French King, King Louis XIV, made all of them crown colonies. Now, French government in the islands, it tended to reflect the governing system that was present in mainland France in Europe. So the islands therefore had no parliament or assemblies like what Barbados had. So this was how the government in the French islands was structured. First of all, the ultimate power was the French monarch. Then under the French monarch, you had the lieutenant general of the islands who was in charge, who was like the, the governor of the governors of all the islands. And then you had the specific governor of each island. However, the French monarch also instituted intendants. Intendants would have been somewhat like spies of the king who kept a very close eye on the governor of the island to ensure that the governor was carrying out policies in favor of the French monarch. The French monarch also instituted a king's council that gave advice to the governor of the island. However, the council played no part in implementing um, any legislation and so on, as was the case with the English islands. Now, the French West India Company was supplied with and acquired much capital. As a result, they were able to establish a monopoly in the slave trade, buying the majority of slaves from the West African slaving stations that were owned by the Dutch. I remember that from the last episode, so you can check out the last episode for more clarity on how the Dutch acquired those West African slaving stations. Now, the company then began taking over the slave trade with the government assisting by giving concessions. So, for example, there was the absence of import duties with bounties paid for each slave exported. Many French settlers wanted more slaves, which made this venture initially successful. However, they wanted to continue trading with the Dutch. As a result, after the bankruptcy of the West India Company, French settlers were free to trade with foreigners and vice versa. Now let's take a look, just a brief look at the Dutch and Danish island colonies. Now the thing with the Dutch is that unlike the British and the French and the Spanish, they were more interested in establishing trading stations and not necessarily establishing plantations. They were also more limited in manpower than the other European powers because their population was lower. So therefore, they wanted to concentrate that available manpower more in the settlements that they captured from the Portuguese in the Eastern Hemisphere. Now, the Dutch attempted to settle the island of Tobago in the year 1628, but they were driven away by the local Kalinago people. A second attempt in Tobago was made in the year 1633, but it ended just after three years, this time with the Spanish destroying that settlement. The Dutch then decided to settle smaller islands that the Spanish disregarded. These islands included St. Thomas, Tortola, Anguilla, St. Eustatius, St. Martin, and Saber all of which were colonized by the Dutch between the years 1630 and 1648. They eventually lost Anguilla and Tortola to the English in the years 1650 and 1672, respectively. The Dutch also settled on the islands of Curacao, Bonaire, and Aruba in the year 1634. Now, the Spanish officially recognized the independence of the Netherlands, their colonies, and the right of their vessels to navigate and trade in the Caribbean in the year 1648. Now, the Spanish kind of had no choice but to do this due to the increasing strength of the Dutch Navy. Now, the Danes, um, who were from Denmark, they were also encouraged by the Dutch, and they were specifically encouraged by Dutch merchants and so on who were living in Copenhagen, Denmark at the time, to explore and trade in the Caribbean. 
Danish trading voyages began in the year 1652 with the King of Denmark authorizing the colonization of St. Thomas, which was at the time abandoned by the Dutch. The Danes then established a permanent settlement there in the year 1672. And finally, let's take a look because we kept hearing the name repeating over and over. Let's take a look at the Europeans and their relations with the Kalinago people groups. Now the Kalinagos who were referred to as the Caribs by the Europeans, they were observed to be more warlike in nature than the Taino people. Despite this warlike nature, their initial reaction to the Europeans was actually a friendly one. However, after encountering hostility from Europeans, many of them reciprocated that with hostility of their own. It was even observed that many Kalinagos that approached Europeans with initial hostility would have done so because of reports they might have heard from other Kalinagos from other islands. Wow, wow. So as soon as those Kalinagos saw those Europeans because they heard of what the Europeans did, they didn't have any time to be friendly. Hostility one time. Now, the only continuously good relations the Kalinagos had war with the Dutch in the Guyanas. This was because one, there was a lot of land available for both groups to occupy without interfering with each other. And two, the Dutch were focused more on trading than on colonization. As a result, the Dutch and the Kalinago developed trade between each other in the Guyanas. The English and the French had tumultuous relationships with the Kalinagos in the smaller Eastern Caribbean islands. These two nations wanted more land, but the islands presented less land. They therefore resorted to taking land from the Kalinagos, which resulted in immense conflict. Now, the Kalinagos in general resisted European influence and colonial efforts. As a result, unlike the Taino, the Kalinagos never adopted European culture, religion, or governance. Now, the Europeans saw themselves as superior to the Kalinagos. They saw them as in the Europeans saw the Kalinagos as heathen, primitive, and basically wild. The Europeans saw their culture as being superior to the culture of the Kalinago people, and they saw the Kalinago's refusal to adopt European values and virtues as being hostility. Now, despite all of this, many Europeans had relations and even marriages with Kalinago's women. Thomas Warner, for example, the first settler of St. Kitts, was in a common law relationship with a local Kalinago woman. And even Grunew again from the Guyanas, he also had a marriage with the Kalinago woman that lasted for 40 years. That's very good. Now, friendly force encounters between the Europeans and the Kalinagos were witnessed in the Guyanas and St. Kitts. In other territories, such as Martinique, Guadeloupe, St. Lucia, and Grenada, however, the first encounters were hostile from the start. Settlements in Grenada and St. Lucia were particularly difficult and even had to be temporarily halted because of Kalinago's resistance. Similar attacks were also noted in St. Thomas, Barbuda, and of course, Tobago. On the island of Grenada, an unfortunate series of events occurred where many Kalinagos, to escape European tyranny, leapt to their deaths in an area known as Carib's Leap in the tongue of Sartius to the very northern tip of Grenada. However, of all the Kalinagos in the islands and in the Guyanas, none were as warlike as the Kalinagos on the islands of Dominica and St. Vincent. These Kalinagos were absolutely feared even by other Kalinago people groups. Now the Kalinagos from these two islands were not only warlike, they actually raided other island territories. As a result, many Taino and even many other Kalinagos lived in fear of the Kalinagos from Dominica and St. Vincent. Kalinagos attacked from Dominica on the islands 
of Antigua and Montserrat were major hindering factors to the proper establishment of the European colonies there. It was even said that the wife and children of Edward Warner, who was the son of Thomas Warner, who was then, when, and Edward, of course, was then governor of Antigua, his wife and his children, they were carried off by Kalinagos who came from Dominica. Now, the Kalinagos from St. Vincent, along with carrying out raids, they were strategic in impacting the stability of England's attempts at Caribbean colonial rule. These Kalinagos created the island into something like a, like a Carib Republic, which saw St. Vincent becoming a safe haven for runaway African slaves. This led to interrelations occurring between the Kalinagos and Africans on the island, creating another unique indigenous group who were known as the Garifuna or the Black Caribs. As a result of such resistance, since their discovery, the islands of Dominica and St. Vincent remained uncolonized for over 200 years, thereby becoming the last island nations in the Caribbean region to be officially settled and colonized by Europeans. The English had initially ignored this and tried to approach the Dominican and Vincentian Kalinagos with force. However, this resulted in the English experiencing major loss and setbacks. The French, on the other hand, decided to establish a treaty with the Kalinagos. So you see the difference in approach here. This made the French able to cohabit with the Kalinagos, with the Kalinagos even adopting certain French practices and even French names. And this was actually seen more in the case of, for example, the Garifuna on the island of St. Vincent and not necessarily the earlier Kalinago people groups, all right? Now, both France and England had agreed to label the islands of Dominica, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and Tobago as neutral islands. As a result, nobody should go there and we should evacuate all our settlers from those islands. However, this was never really done. And this is where we come to an end of our look at the establishment of the island colonies. And it was a very good lesson. I, it was very, very insightful. But in our next episode, we're going to continue looking at European rivalry. And we're going to specifically take a look at the British colonial system in the Caribbean. But this has been another episode of Island Uplift History Class, and I hope to see you in the next one. But for now, class dismissed.